What's going on everybody? I am the Bad Duck and you are the internet. Welcome back to another video. Today we are wrapping up the Raimi trilogy once and for all in our spectacular summer of Spider-Man with Spider-Man 3 of course with the trilogy finally being done in this 2007 film. This film actually has a lot of like nostalgia really attached to it for myself. Um, it was like one of the more, it was one of the first Spider-Mans where I was just like enamored with the character and that's why I think I love Venom so much because this is the first appearance of Venom in cinema and I think that overall I have a lot of attachment to it. I remember having a black Spider-Man suit when I was younger and uh, I tried to put off those feelings for this for from back then for this film while watching it while re-watching it and um, I think I came out better for it. I don't it might seep into my opinion a little bit but and all in all, I don't think I really have a terrible thought. Like, I don't have terrible feelings for this film at all. I think the film is perfectly fine. I don't think it's, like, mind-blowing, but I don't think it's bad in any type of means. So let's kind of just get into it. Um, the first thing I want to point out with the film is that the cinematography is much more upgraded from the first two films. The first two films very feel like they had, like, the sepia tone, kind of, like, just, like, bleh. It's not like the no no colors pop out. It's just kind of muted. It's just it's uh, it's fine to look at, but it's never like fun to look at. Here in Spider-Man Three, for some reason, um, I don't know if it's the lighting or the way they shot the film, just like the cinematography and all all of that. Um, but a lot of the colors pop out. There's a lot more deeper shadows. It's just, it, it just it's just a prettier film to look at, and I and I think that a lot of people kind of gloss over that when they watch the film and so they're like oh it looks a bit better it, it looks a lot better than the first two films and that that's a big big stepping point um because the first two films are, just don't aren't fun to look at and um when you're watching something you want to i know a lot of people are like oh don't look this 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 best cgi doesn't mean anything it can still be a good film yes but when something looks good you enjoy it more it's just it's simple math you enjoy something more when it looks nice when it looks good when films that look bad you're kind of like oh i don't want to fucking be here this looks like shit i i think the film looks amazing they did a like whatever they did between the second and the third film um it's very much upgraded and it's a very very much a positive in my in my heart of hearts because it just looks like good fun moving on into like the actual like story and everything like that um Meh. It, it's very meh. Um, they they spent a lot of time building up the villains in this because they have technically three villains throughout the film, even though one of them like turns and becomes a good guy at the end. Um, the only one I really care for is Flint Marco as the Sandman or the Sandman, Flint Marco, whatever you want to call him. Um, I really don't feel much for any of the other ones. Uh, Pete and Brock are on like the peril paths um kind of thing like they're just parallel paths with but like they have different morals and again we've we talked about this before in the first film with the uh, green goblin that can be done really really well and it's been done really really well especially in the first film but i don't think it really does anything here like it does something here but like they just kind of like rush it at the end they don't have proper progression for it that's kind of just like the story behind the film is that there's a bunch of infighting between Sam Raimi and the higher ups at Sony. Uh, Avi Arad, he really wanted Venom because I think it was about toy sales or something like that. Venom is a, a very popular character in the comics and I think that Avi really wanted to bring that into the, the movies. They didn't do the proper regression. Sam Raimi didn't have it in his heart for it. He really doesn't like Venom overall. I, I've, I've seen in multiple reports that he really didn't know who Venom was because he, he was... He's an older guy. He, he grew up on the 60s and 70s comics where, like, you had the Sandman, the, the, you had the Vulture, you had Dr. Octopus and the Green Goblin. You had all those fun people, but, like, Venom really didn't exist until, like, the 90s, especially in his current form. You can kind of feel that throughout the film. Venom is very much disserviced in this film, even though I loved him back then. He looks good, more or less. He looks good for Topher Grace, and I think it's also another point is that Topher Grace, um, isn't the physical embodiment of Eddie Brock, who's like hulking, mass of a man, but he also, but he does do a good job at, at portraying Eddie Brock as kind of like a normal guy. Um, it's here or there 
really if you that if that's what you want that really depends upon you um I didn't really find it to be an issue I think Tough Grace did a great job as Eddie Brock but yeah um but yeah the two are on parallel paths but different morals we saw that with Spider-Man 1 with the Green Goblin and Pete but here it's just kind of like I don't really give a shit because this conflict between you two is kind of just there for the plot and it, it, it don't you don't feel the hate between the two um especially when Pete's in like the black suit he doesn't feel like he actually hates him um more or even just doesn't like him he just wants the job that uh, J. Jonah Jameson has kind of been holding over his head or holding from him so it's fine the the story there is okay I don't really care for it um the Sandman uh story is wonderfully done um and that that's because Sam Rumi really wanted to do it he really understood the character of the Sandman and I just understood how to make that character, you know, vulnerable and portray that on the screen. And it's wonderfully done in that one scene where after the the collider or whatever you want to call it, um, that beautiful, like, literally quiet scene of him just trying to pick up the pendant or whatever it's called. And it's just, it's just wonderfully done. And that's where almost most of the CGI budget went, went to in the end, I think. Because uh, a lot of the CGI... Well, it looks good and it looks better than the first film. Um, kind of takes a step back from the second film because a lot of this looks more like rubber and very much P, uh, PS3 gra graphics, which is, you know, the time when this was made, 2007, was right in the middle of uh, the PS3 and uh, Xbox 360 era, so it's not like it's out of place, but, like, it could be better. <laughs> um, but if it's for that amazing shot, I can get over those that CGI it's not terrible where it's like throwing me out of the film, um, but it's fine. Um, the Harry Osborne final confrontation between him and Peter um, is okay. Again, I think that they had a lot of they didn't have a lot of time to kind of like figure out what to do with Harry in this film. They kind of just chucked him together and just kind of threw him at a wall in the end. And I think like that, that goes back to like having him having amnesia at the beginning of the film is kind of just like convenient in the end. I I just think it's dumb. Um, they kind of just need Harry to be friendly and then turn on him again. I just think that overall you could have just done a lot better. Um, especially because we've been building three films for it and it kind of just kind of ends up in a, like a soft landing. And that's never like a, like a, oh shit. And they, they team up at the end, which is nice. It's, it's great to see, but like, I just don't, I needed to have an actual, like, physical outcome from it and they do they have a lot of action scenes here between Harry and Peter are brutal and they're amazing but it's overshadowed by the Venom suit being part of it if the Venom suit wasn't in it or at least part of that scene having Peter have these actions and make these actions by himself would be a lot better of, of just a development in their relationship that Peter just has given up on his friend at this point and then has to come back to Harry to save Mary Jane in the end because they both care for her um so it's a kind of like a, a last ditch effort from him and yeah so um again they they missed a lot of the the villain opportunities here and that th the thing here is that you go from Green Goblin, Willem Dafoe, one of the best and like one of the best comic book villains of all time and then go into that Gok who I believe is the best comic book villain of all time I'm I, I put him like top 10 top 15 let's hear there um but you go from two great villains and then you go into hey there's this dude who, he kind of just like is a dick and has rivalry with Peter because of the story we have this guy who wants to like save his daughter and then we retcon the first film and say that he actually killed Uncle Ben whoa like why did you have to do that um but yeah, like, and then you have the third one, which you build building up this villain for, but you kind of just, like, don't do much with it, so, um, neither here nor there. I think that the villains are just a lot. There's a lot of villains. It's quantity over quality here, and I don't really hold the film against it. I think it's perfectly fine with the three villains, so it's whatever. Peter, um, I'm fine with. A lot of people are like, Pete with the Venom suit is just cringy and, like, like, just gross. Yes, that's the point. The point of him is to be an asshole because that's what the suit is doing, and this is what he, and the suit is like under cool and and hip or whatever you want to call it. Um, 
and this is what Pete thinks cool and hip is. That's the whole point. Pete's a loser. He's gonna do loser things that he thinks is cool. So I don't. I think the Bully McGuire scene, especially the dancing, is perfectly fine and perfectly in character. I think it's actually helps the film overall. Um, and just exemplifies how fucking dumb this is, or how Pete has just kind of fallen. Mary Jane, um, I still have a problem with. She's better in this film, actually. I thought she'd be worse in this film. From what I remember, she's just a screaming damsel in distress, which she has been in the last three films. Quite literally, she is the fucking, like, the, the climax point in all three of these films is that, hey, we're gonna drop her off a br bridge from Green Goblin, you know, call it, make kind of call out to, like, Gwen Stacy. Um, and then two, she's kidnapped by Dr. Octopus to the reactor because he, because he needs to drag out Spider-Man. Um, and then three, Venom takes her. <laughs> she literally is the climactic point in all of these. It's the whole reason. And, and from that point, I don't know how anyone does not find out that Peter is Spider-Man. Just saying. Maybe maybe look into like Mary Jane's dating history. Probably a good idea. Maybe they come across the like astronaut. Might be like, yo, astronaut, are you Spider-Man? Um, but yeah, I. I She's better, I guess, in this film. She actually has reasons to complain. I get I get that, like, in the last few films, that Peter's kind of just absent because he's been trying to do with Spider-Man stuff, and that makes sense perfectly. But she actually has reasons to complain about Pete in this film. That's, again, mostly due to the Ven Venom suit, but also because of his shitty actions throughout the film. Because um, towards the beginning of the film, after he saves Bryce Dallas, Dallas Howard's Gwen Stacy, um, he kisses her as Spider-Man, but, like, still kisses her. He's about to be married to her, or try to get married to her, and uh, married to um, MJ, and he kisses another woman. It, she has a reason to be pissed. There's other reasons to be pissed throughout uh, the film as well, but again, some of those are from the Venom suit. Um, but yeah, I didn't really have a huge problem with her. Um, moving to Harry Osborn, um, another mainstay in the film, in, in the trilogy, they took a step back. They had this epic build up, this, like, hatred build up from the second film like it you can it is palpable palpable and they kind of just like oh let's give him amnesia at the beginning of the film after he attacks peter okay so now he's not harry for the next hour or the, the harry that's been like brewing this vengeance for who could be creating problems from for peter throughout the film um i think which would be a much more beneficial part of like his part in the film but um they didn't take that part, so, um, <laughs> but yeah, um, he gets amnesia throughout the film, and it just kind of just like, well, fuck, you know, what, what are we gonna do now? And then they, he remembers eventually, they have the, they have that whole, like, scuffle in, the, like, the living room area, which is a really good action scene, um, all the action scenes here are great, especially the Harry versus Peter action scenes are, have been, are amazing, um, I think that they're well choreographed and well done, um, but yeah, moving back to uh, Harry's character, um, and then he kind of just like after that, and after Bernard tells him that his his father killed like killed himself, it doesn't feel like a proper ending for that rivalry and that that anger. Um, but like it's, it's fine. Again, all these choices were not great choices, but they were fine choices. I this film is like I said is fine. It's well done, but like okay in the end it's not a bad film in whatever respect it's it's a good film and just i think a lot of people need to look back at it and kind of like dissect it properly and kind of look at it through the lens of this the film by itself you can't put it within the trilogy because the trilogy is amazing i mean, the first two films are um, nine to nine and eight out of tens this film is like a seven and that eight to seven drop is a big drop it's a, it's from a good film to an average film and here it's just an average film. I don't think there's a problem with having an average film here. Um, every every trilogy has that meh film. There's the Return of the Jedi's of um, Star Wars. Return of the Jedi. It's an okay film. You can't do three films in a row and be perfect on all three. It, it happens. So um, yeah, I think that again we need to look back at this film in perspective of. What is it a good film by itself? And that's all you really need to do, because if you can't, you can't not, you can't critique a film based off its other counterparts. You can't critique it based off of 
its previous installments. It, it just that's bad cri criticism. It's criticizing something for its past, and you criticize it for what it is. And what it, the film is is okay, and that's perfectly fine. I, I think that you know it's good to have okay films from time to time. Thank you guys for watching. I'm the Bad Tech, and you are the internet. I will see you guys in the next video, which is next week's Amazing Spider-Man. We're going to the reboot with Andrew Garfield and the Lizard in that weird um, sunglass mask. I'd, we'll talk about it next week. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for watching. Uh, merch is in the, in the description below. Remember to subscribe. It is always free. And I'll see you guys next week.